Our next presenter is a leading voice for the integration of traditional and complementary or alternative medicine. Bob Duggan is the president and co-founder of the Thai Sophia Institute, a unique combination of professor, clinical practitioner, management executive, and inspirational leader. Please join me in welcoming Bob Duggan. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. I'm honored to be here. How many of you get enough acknowledgement in life? <laughs> so would all of those of you who created today, all the volunteers, all those who made this amazing day happen, stand? Would you stand, the volunteers? Everybody who helped make it happen? Now, those of you who stood, did you take in the acknowledgement, Dave? Yeah, it's good. It's good? It feels good to get, take in some acknowledgement. So I'm grateful and honored to be here, and I'm going to take us in maybe a slightly different direction. I was aware, John Walsh, talking about the anonymity of the internet and people sending me hugs on the internet. I'd really, there you are, I'd really rather get it in the flesh. So I want to talk a little bit about that difference between the fleshiness of life and the abstraction and then the anonymity of it. And then the stories. How do we, what do we use when we use words? What are words? And then I was deeply touched by Karen when you were talking globally about the ancestors. So I'm, I'm grateful to be here. And these pictures, I only have a few of them, but they're by an artist, Celia Pearson, in Annapolis and they're of the seasons. So we're gonna walk through the seasons of life as I speak. And so, um, oh, they're not in the order. We've been there, that's the, so we're, we're about to be in winter, aren't we? We're like winter, winter occurs in us. We can be still and silent and peaceful. And when we're still and silent, still and silent, sometimes there's enormous power within us. So winter, as a time of deep stillness and quiet, something I often think in my 35 years of clinical practice, I probably spend most of my time asking people, do they know how to practice stillness? Winter, I'm aware I was in northern New York at one point, and I became aware that um, Went out in 20 below weather, I was doing this. I grew up in Manhattan. Then I realized how to relax and take a breath in order to be able to cope with the cold. It was counterintuitive, tightened against it. So I'm very aware of this, this issue of how we breathe, how we are present. Lao Tzu, the great Chinese sage, says that he who speaks doesn't know or she who speaks doesn't know, and he who speaks, she who knows doesn't speak. So I had the thought, should we have 17 minutes, is it, of silence? <laughs> Stillness, quiet, do I dare speak? And if we dare speak, how do we speak? What do we speak about? I thought of taking a vote to see whether we should stand here in silence after the whole day. But I'm going to dare to speak. And I'm going to request that like the stillness of winter, um, I'm going to ask for your listening. You can't give me, I can't accept, expect your listening. Your listening is a gift to me. So I'm asking for the gift of your listening. And I'm asking you to design your listening. Karen said earlier that perhaps listening is one of the greatest healing gifts on the planet. And I say most of us may not be practiced in the art of listening. What is the major complaint in the American healthcare system? Nobody listens. So I'm asking for a particular listening. I know I'm highly practiced and trained to listen critiquing, questioning, judging, liking, not liking, agreeing, disagreeing. So I'd ask you to suspend that way of listening and just listen. Let's see if you can allow questions, and really these are many questions, 
thoughts, possibilities. Allow them to wash in without making decisions about them or critiquing. And also as you listen, notice where the sound of different speakers arrives in your body. Do you pay attention to the sound wave as it approaches you? Every word I speak, in my experience in the clinic and elsewhere, impacts your body. Every word you speak impacts my body. My wife Susan will often say to me, Bob, we need to talk. You know that one? Uh-oh. <laughs> and then if she says, I love you, my body goes in a different direction. So a word has a biologic, biochemical, med medical effect over here. If you study with us at the Institute, we'd say to you, we're not going to let you touch an herb or an acupuncture needle or any other treatment modality until you've learned to deliver the treatment by a word. Think about the power of a word. You walk into a 7-Eleven and you're in a foul mood and you grouse at the clerk and the clerk is nasty to the next person. The next person goes home and slaps their child. Who really slapped the child? Your word? Is, a, is that a contagion going on? Is that a viral infection? So what about this possibility of being aware of the deep power within each of us, the power of us like winter, of silence, of unknowing? And when we stay in that long enough, when we stay in that, spring t in that winter long enough, then spring emerges. And out of it pops a spring, a coming up. Something is going to emerge out of the silence, out of the no thing, out of the coldness, out of the depth. Crocuses, tulips, and it'll be, each will be different, each plant reaching for the sun. So words, words and arising. Man had an impact on me and all of the people I've treated over the past 30 years. About 30 years ago, a man named Charlie came into my office one day and he said, Bob, I never thought asthma would be my friend. And I said, Charlie, what the hell are you talking about? Asthma is your friend? And he said, yeah. He said, a couple of months ago when I started here, I was in and out of emergency rooms. I was always on prednisone. He said, now I'm aware, two or three days earlier, I begin to have some wheezing. And if I wake up to the wheezing, I realize I've not been, had enough sleep. I've had too much caffeine. I've been having a fight with my wife. I'm not eating the right foods. I'm not resting. So the wheezing actually reminds me to take care of myself. So please don't cure me of my asthma. Now we have enough data we've collected over the years which says, somebody says, my migraine actually starts days earlier. I've never cured a migraine. Now think of the implications of that asthma is my friend for a $2.2 trillion healthcare budget. What if we're asking the wrong question? What if the body is indeed deeply wise and we have a system predicated on a totally erroneous question? I'm not going to go into it, but we have a lot of data that says people do not have satisfaction clinically from getting rid of their symptoms. People have satisfaction when they've learned how to be in charge of their symptoms. Clinical satisfaction is from empowerment. Just think about the implications of that clinically and for the cost structure of healthcare reform in our United States. Another example. When I was three, my mother was expecting a baby. And then my mother died in childbirth. Baby didn't come home, mom didn't come home. It's wartime, 1943. Dad disappeared, he was working 12 hours a day, six days a week. I'm shuffled around to grandparents and uncles and aunts. What do you say to that? Most people say tragedy or problem, but my father came home and my father would say to me, when I did see him every week, he'd say, you, you're a very privileged young man. Most young boys have their mothers here with them. And he'd point up to a star if we were outside and he'd say, your mother's at the right hand of God, so you're protected, you're a special kid for the rest of your life. Was he right? Was it true? I don't know. Did it serve? Did that speaking serve? I say yes. 
So the use of words, I say, is about creating partnership. And that takes us into summertime, into the fullness of summer. And takes us into partnership. Think of a warm, sun, sunny day in the summer with your friends and relatives, and you're playing with your children, or you're, it's about, life is about relationship. Life is about how do we be together. Charlie opened up a possibility within his body. My father opened a possibility of relationship. So how do other cultures say what to speak? How do we know what to say? What are you going to say when you go out of here tonight? So every other culture that I know of on the planet doesn't speak from what do I want to say or what do I believe or what am I about. They say, as I speak, and so this is the place of decision about words. Essentially, would my great-grandfather be proud of my speaking right now? Would Patty Duggan, would Mary Walsh, in Dungarvan, be proud if they could hear me now? And then the even more important question is, will my words right now serve my great-grandchildren? I have eight grandchildren. The reason I'm here today is because of those grandchildren. What world will exist for them? That's the key question. So whatever we do, technology or inner work or medicine or healing, other cultures don't say, say whatever you want. They say, say what will create a world that will honor the ancestors and serve the grandchildren. That's what every culture in the world has said. So as we're going along, that's the summertime. It's this relatedness that we're all connected. We're all in a family, and it's all about keeping that set of relationships going. Ah, this technology is not quite serving me. Anyway, the next slide, and I may have pressed it and run fast through. Um, let's see if we can get back there. Anyway, it's the harvest time. It's OK. Let's use that one. It's harvest. It's late summer. You know what comes after summer, right? What comes after summer? It's not autumn, is it? It's late summer. It's not the fullness. It's not the fall. It's late summer. It's harvest time. And so that's a time of acknowledging the abundance. So are you acknowledging the abundance today? That's why I brought up acknowledgment. And I want to keep coming back to acknowledgment. My mentor for 50 years was the great philosopher, historian, social critic, Ivan Illich. And I was speaking in Hanover, Germany at a large conference, and I was unfortunately scheduled to follow Ivan. And he got up, and I hadn't heard him say this before. He said, the hell with health. He said, it's our most dangerous and destructive certitude. The idea that a human could be healthy, it's an abstraction. It's an abstraction. It's not a reality. We all have our symptoms coming and going. Just like asthma became a teacher for Charlie. Charlie was no longer trying to be healthy and not have asthma. Charlie was exploring my breathing. You know, we're, how are we thoughtful? I'm going to ask all of you, or promise all of you, you know, if a patient comes into me with one symptom, I guarantee they're going to go out with five because we're going to spend enough time until you understand all the little symptoms that you throw away, that you don't pay attention to, that happen every day. You wouldn't do it with your car. How many of you, when the oil light goes on in your car, put a Band-Aid over it? <laughs> How many? None of you. How many of you, when you have a headache, take an aspirin? Same thing. Your body's saying, get some rest. Uh-uh, I'm going to paper it over. So what are your four or five wisdom, thoughtful, harvest symptoms that teach you how to stay well regardless of a healthcare system? I was doing an exercise over a series of weeks with some medical students, sophomore, second year medical students, and one in the sixth or seventh week said to his classmates, you know, I haven't told any of you this, but um, during the summer, I began to have a lump in my throat, and I went to see my doctor, and they couldn't figure it out, and so he sent me to a surgeon. I was supposed to have surgery. I was scheduled for surgery next week, and last week after class, I was so upset. I had such a horrific day. 
And I went out and it was raining and I usually bicycle to school. So I got on my bicycle, I'm heading home and it's pouring rain and I got lost. He said I was, I was a mess. I got home and I started to yell at everybody. I fell asleep crying like I haven't cried since a little baby. I woke up and the lump is gone. He said during the week I've noticed now that when I'm tense, my throat tightens. If I don't let it go, it becomes a lump. I was about to have surgery. This man's a scientist, but not paying attention to the wisdom and science from his own body. So a lot of what I am talking to you about is the recovery of our fleshy senses. I want to make it very practical for you. When you go to a restaurant, how many of you have the experience of picking up the menu and say, oh, that sounds wonderful, I'm going to have that. How many? Don't you do that? You love, oh, I haven't had that in a long time. So here's a thought. Take the menu then and put it away and have a lovely conversation for 15 minutes with your friend. Then pick up the menu and say, what will I have that my body will feel wonderful after I've eaten it? And I will bet almost anything it'll be a rare event when you'll order the same. Because one is coming from your thoughts about the world. The other one is from your body sensory experience of the world. It's the recovery of that sensory common sense. So some gifts. Do you practice listening? I mean, seriously, do you practice listening? Do you know how to listen? You might take it for granted because your ears work, but you might not have learned the art of listening. A lot of this conference, and Dave, what you're creating is can we see new possibilities? Not very often we're driving, and what we're driving is looking in the rearview mirror, steering the car. Because we're looking at life as, as it's been. Question is, what would it look like if you looked out a rearview mirror and saw all new possibilities, like springtime? And are you aware that life is about the seven generations? Are you thoughtful about that? Have you created an observer of yourself? And an observer of the world around you? The development of heightened sensory awareness. It may be that common sense is having all five senses fully awake. So if that's so, we come to the autumn and that's, doesn't it take your breath away, the leaves? It's looking unbelievable, these last weeks of autumn. And we say it, oh, wow, I took my breath away. So the autumn is about leaves falling and about death. And we have a culture, believe it or not, we actually have a medical system based on preventing death. Think about that for a minute. I think it's $600 billion in the last six months of life. Imagine a culture predicated on avoiding death. Maybe it makes sense. It doesn't in any world that I know of. The question is, how do we live into the letting go? How do we live into uh, the beauty of life? How do we breathe and be aware right now that you're breathing? Another question at this moment would be, is there anything that if you were to die right now or your loved one were to die right now, is anything incomplete? My fourth grade teacher would say that to us every day. Today she'd be put in jail for saying it. But Sister Jean used to say, now, think about it. It's the greatest gift of my life. She'd say, and I knew it because my mother had died. Is there anything incomplete? Make sure it's complete before you go to bed. If any of you have something incomplete to say to a loved one, I recommend you get your cell phone, go out right now and do it. That's a different way of being present in the world. So, in conclusion, I'm drawing us to this place of what are you going to harvest from today? What will you speak out of today? What words will you craft that will be a gift to the grandchildren from all the possibilities that occurred today? And I recommend that you do it by, I asked at the beginning. I don't think anyone put up their hands that I have more than acknowledgement than I can use. So give everybody around you lots of acknowledgement. We know everybody's starved for it. How? Because it's right here. How many of you get enough listening? Give the gift of listening. These very simple gifts. And in concluding, I'm going to read something. Um, I'm told, or at least I've seen it written, that it was written by Nelson Mandela. 
Marianne Williamson. I found it on a bulletin board in my office the other day with the name Barack Obama on it. <laughs> so it must have been written by the universe. But I ask you to practice taking it in and listen. Our deepest fear is not that we are inadequate. Our deepest fear is that we are powerful beyond measure. It is our light, not our darkness, that most frightens us. We ask ourselves, who am I to be brilliant, gorgeous, talented, fabulous? You are a child of the universe. Your playing small does not serve the next generations. It does not serve the world. There's nothing enlightened about shrinking so that other people won't feel insecure around you. We are born to make manifest the glory of the God, Allah, the oneness that is within us. It's not just in some of us, it's in everyone. And as we let our own light shine, we unconsciously give other people permission to do the same. We are liberated, as we are liberated from our own fear, our presence automatically liberates others. So go and let all your light shine and give it away and give away the acknowledgement and thank you for creating this event today. Thank you for your listening.